Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome. This is 10,000 Hours versus the Sports Gene. My name is Brad Genzer. I'm a second year graduate student at MIT, and I'm the organizer for this panel. Uh, we have a very special panel for you today. Today, our panelists, we have Malcolm Gladwell and David Epstein, two critically acclaimed authors, and I think you know why you're here. Two differing theories, two different, uh, differing arguments, and uh, I won't take any words out of their mouth, and I'll pass it on to them in a second. But first, I'd like to make a few administrative announcements. Uh, once again, we ask that you move towards the center of, of the room as people will come in later and also consolidate the seating. Uh, there will be time for question and answer. So throughout the panel, feel free to ask questions via text or Twitter. Uh, we are, if you're going to text, text to 22333. The code word for this is Gene, and then your question. So you're going to text Gene, G-E-N-E, -E, and then your question. Uh, and for Twitter, it's the same format, but you're going to tweet it at poll, P-O-L-L. This, uh, this panel will last for an hour, and we'll have about 15 minutes for questions. So we have quite, <laughs> this is going to be a great panel. And uh, like I said, I'm not going to argue for the panelists, but I will hand it over to each opposite panelist to try to articulate uh, their opponent's viewpoint. So with that, I'll hand it to Malcolm and David. Should I go first? Sure. OK, so we're going to start by having, I'm going to describe David's argument, David's going to describe my argument, and then we're going to argue with each other's descriptions of each other's argument. Um, <laughs> the Sports Gene, a book I liked very much, I should say, and if you haven't read it, you should, um, uh, is making, I would say, two arguments. One is an argument about genetic variability uh, and saying that what we are observing uh, when we watch sports at the elite level is essentially uh, the spectacle of human genetic variability in action, and that the, for someone to be an elite athlete, they are uh, almost invariably possessed of a highly unusual set of genetic traits that differ markedly from the norm. That's observation number one, I think, if I'm reading your book correctly. A second argument is more broadly, the book is about, is a, is a structural understanding of athletic excellence. That is to say, I'm thinking here of the chapters on distance running in which you situate East African uh, running and Jamaican to some extent, but more East African running uh, prowess in the context of their uh, geography and uh, anthropology as well as their genetics um, as a way to come to a uh, an understanding of why they're so dominant. So, and both of those are interesting because they are, it makes you realize how much our uh, standard descriptions of athletic excellence um, are wanting. That is to say, we're, we rarely do those kinds of broader structural explanations, and we are usually much more interested in the nurture side of the explanation than we are in the nature side, which is why I thought the book was uh, uh, so fascinating. I would agree with that, um, especially the fascinating part. Yeah. No. We're not getting off to a particularly no. contentious start it's here. Good, it's good we have a big crowd, though. Malcolm, I told you a lot of people would come to see me. You know, I know you were <laughs> would be here. Um, but no, so the, the 10,000 hours um, to, to describe that, and, and I want to make a distinction between um, what I think Malcolm said about the 10,000 hours and what I think uh, has sort of percolated in... Um, in, in public, basically. So uh, the, the strict form uh, of the 10,000 hours, because we, we've had a little bit of a debate about whether I set up a straw man. So the strict form of the 10,000 hours is this idea that uh, 10,000 hours of practice is both necessary and sufficient for anyone to achieve expertise in anything. And this manifests in, like a couple months ago, I was at the Australian Institute of Sport, and a coach who was visiting showed me a plan to take kids from age 8 to 18 in exactly 10,000 hours. Um, so that's, that's sort of the extreme interpretation. That's not the one um, that Malcolm makes. I think uh, that the interpretation Malcolm makes is um, that the 10,000 hour rule is, is, is a principle, meaning once people are pre-screened for a certain ability level, after that level, um, practice is the difference. Practice and, and other support factors are the difference. So in that way, actually we've been talking lately about the threshold hypothesis, and now I'm starting to see your description of the 10,000 hours as a version of the threshold hypothesis, where uh, at, at a certain, uh, above a certain threshold, um, 
stable abilities of natural talent no longer um, uh, distinguish people to the same extent, if, uh, if I'm describing that correctly. And, and I have my own thoughts on it, but I think that's, mm -hmm. that's what your description is actually. And, and as we've been talking about the threshold hypothesis, I think I've more and more been realizing that that's what the ten, your version of the 10,000 hour rule yeah. was. Yeah, we, we, we're, we should later circle back to thresholds, which okay. are really interesting. Um, but I would say, to add to that, what's confusing about the 10,000 hour idea is that it was um, originally put forward by Herbert Simon and William Chase in this very famous paper in the 1960s in which they were concerned about chess. And Simon and Chase make this observation. They're trying to describe what is it that um, distinguishes an elite chess player. And their argument is what chess players appear to be capable of doing is um, they, because they have been exposed to um, an extraordinarily large number of scenarios on the chessboard, they have been able to make sense of those scenarios in larger and larger chunks. And they, Simon introduces this notion of chunking in memory, which is basically the size of the, uh, of the, of the scenario you can make sense of in one, in one instant. So Gwen Gretzky on the on the hockey on the on the on the on ice could ch or Larry Bird had these huge chunks they could see the full complexity of something of the situation in front of them because they had processed that versions of that scenario so many times in the past. So Simon's argument is that an elite chess player has to have played for a certain amount of time if they are to chunk at an elite level. So you have to have been exposed to all of these different chessboard sequences before you can. And so he said he guessed that you would need to have at least 10,000 hours of exposure before you, uh, so that's one version. But then Anders Ericsson, who is the great, more recent popularizer, is precisely, has the hard position that you were talking about earlier. He dispensed with the notion that you would need some kind of threshold level of ability and just said it's all practice. Um, I'm not an Ericsson, Ericksonian. And, and he, he's the scientist who did the famous 10,000 hour paper. Basically. Yeah. Although, I would, this is an important point. The 10,000 hour principle originates with Simon and Chase, not with Erickson. Erickson is, is expanding and, um, uh, and uh, stretching the principle in his work, I think. But as you pointed out in, in um, your very thoughtful critique of me, um, the, the, no, really, it was. Um, the grandmaster chess players actually. In that, that study of eight grandmaster chess players, the range was 14,000 to 50,000 hours. Yeah. So if anything, 10,000. Um, so actually, I thought that was interesting because I, in, in one of the things I wrote in the book was I said, well, the 10,000 hours was always an average of individual differences. So yeah. in, in Erickson's paper, there was no measure of variance included. And so I, I write in the sports gene that the average number of hours of practice to international master status in chess is 11,053 but some people make it in 3,000 and some haven't made it past 25,000, so you don't really care about the average. You want to know the range. Yeah. And, and one of your critiques of that was that I was choosing too low of a level of chess players, to which I said, well, but my guys are over the 10,000 hours, so if they're too low, um, I think that's just kind of a moving of the goalposts. Yeah. Well, you could quibble all day in this argument about, depending on where you choose the level of expertise, you, have, you come up with a different uh, threshold number, right? So, uh, I was simply referring back to the, in Simon and Chase's original observation, they were dealing with grandmasters. So that seemed to me the appropriate place to start. Also, are we that excited about what it takes to be a master level chess player? I mean, there are tens, if not hundreds of thousands of masters chess players in the world. It seems, you know, do people get out of bed to watch masters people play chess? I don't think they do. I think, they, I think we require I, I would argue, though, that actually grandmaster chess players are the worst place to start because it's the extreme of the restriction of your sample range, right? Yeah. And so if you restrict your sample range to that degree, like to think of something that we're all familiar with here, if, if, you, if you restrict, so one of, the, sites I, one of the, the stats I cite in the book is that if you know an American man between the ages of 20 and 40 who's at least seven feet tall, there's a 17% chance he's a current NBA player. And if, if you, if, so height is, height is important, right? At, at each about two inch increase in height after 6'2", there's about an order of magnitude higher chance of being in the NBA. But if you restrict the range to only NBA players, so if you're, if you're studying basketball skill and you restrict your study sample 
based on the dependent variable of basketball skill and use only the best people in the world, the NBA, you'll, you'll find there's actually a negative correlation between height and scoring. So you can end up with these really perverse outcomes. So then you would, you know, your advice based on a study of that would be to tell parents like, not to feed their children because they'll score more in the NBA because they'll be smaller. <laughs> so if, if you restrict your range that way, you can end up with these really bizarre results. So I yeah. think if you, and if you look at, like in some sports now what's emerging is if, indeed, the, if you stand on the Olympic podium and look backward, the, gold, the people on the podium have practiced more than sub-elites. But if you extrapolate it back to childhood, they've actually usually practiced less, and there's a crossover in the mid-teen years. So I think those, the retrospective studies, which are like what the NIH would call level D evidence. I mean, when you restrict to only, Erickson says you should study only the handful of best performers in the world. Mm -hmm. That means all you're left with is case studies. You're just left with journalism, if that's all you do, and not yeah. really science. So I think that's a problematic kind of way. You say that like it's, like it's a bad thing. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> so, no offense to us. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, well, no, but the, let's actually, before we, let's take a step backward and just talk about this uh, general argument. So you have, you've got a continuum of arguments here. You have Erickson over here saying that people who practice in who do deliberate practice, that is to say, in a focused, concentrated, and intelligent way, um, try to master the thing in front of them. Um, they can reach an elite level if they are willing to put in the necessary amount of time. And then you have the middle ground, which I think I occupied in Outliers, which is you have to have some baseline of talent, but you still need to put in that necessary. And then you have, then you can sort of move, you can keep moving over and over and over depending on how much of a role you play, you think each of these two variables play. Um, what interests me is the possibility that there may be a subset of cognitive, cognitively complex human activities for which Erickson is right. That is to say, where uh, deliberate practice is sufficient. And let me give you an example. And this is gonna offend all medical doctors in the room. <laughs> I honestly think that uh, if we restrict ourselves to college graduates, now already I've, already I've, that's a huge leap, but still, pretty large sample of people. I think that, uh, I think that the overwhelming majority of college graduates, given the opportunity, could be better than average cardiac surgeons. That is to say, if, you, if they were willing to commit themselves to, if we put them through 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, they could all end up being good cardiac surgeons. I don't think there's any magical talent, in other words. I think it's just basically, if you're smart enough to get through college, you can be a great surgeon. And, and cardiac surgery is like very much a psychomotor skill, right? And, and would fit into sort of your description of chunking, right? And we can all, we, it's clear that we can all master certain things that are based on chunking, right? Because we yeah. all master language. And if I gave everyone here 20 random words, they'd have trouble repeating them back to me. But if I give them a 20 word sentence, they might be able to because they've learned systems of grammar and groups of words so they can break down that data. So I, I don't know, but I guess what my, what, what I would say is, is what's the proof of that? And, and I think, you know, because I, I think you have to start by saying, well, what, what's the evidence of that? And it, it could be right, but at the same time, if you look at just doctorates in general, say, right, the, um, there are, so in, in, a, in a famous study, the study of mathematically precocious youth, with now these are people who are taken in the 70s, right, and they were, it was based on the top 3%, I think, of state test mm -hmm. scores, and then they were given, like, the, a math test, and the top 1% of that, just within within the top 1%, just the top quartile of ability of the top 1% has more than twice as many doctorates as the bottom quartile of the top 1%. And so I guess I would just say, I think you, you're facing a high bar to justify that. Uh, well, but part of the reason I say that is about cardiac surgeons is that I have a very low opinion of the difficulty of cardiac surgery. Well, that's a different, that's a different <laughs> issue. Whereas I don't about do doctorates in mathematics. Right. I guess I would say, what's the proof of that Oh, including medical doctors, though. Doctorates, juris doctor, all kinds oh, of doctors. Oh, I see, all kinds all of, kinds of doctors. Um, I would say, for, uh, one of the things I would say, is, for example, there are a series of relatively complex uh, psychomotor tasks, which uh, the entire population appears to do at a very high rate of skill. Driving. Dri if you think about it, the driving experiment is kind of astonishing. Driving is insanely complicated. Uh, we operate on the assumption that everyone can learn to drive in a safe way. No one ever questions that. We don't screen for driving. You could, 
My mother is 83. She still drives. I mean, this is a source of astonishment to me. If you knew my mother, you would also be astonished by this. But society doesn't even, no one's even asked her whether she can still drive. She just does. So we have this kind of, we have this enormous confidence as, as a society that there are certain kinds of incredibly complicated tasks that you should be able to do just by virtue of being motivated to do them and have, having put in the time, right? So I'm saying, look, do I think that on a certain level, cardiac surgery is that much harder than driving a car? No, I don't. I think it's, I mean, I think it has, all, it has a, uh, a whole series of, um, of, of, uh, uh, of restrictions around it and uh, a, whole, a, a mythology around it um, and guild rules around it, but if, I'm sorry, if you, could, if you can drive a car, I think you can probably ultimately you, cut your, open Your mother may be an outlier, though. Just so. but, but no, but, but I understand that. No, point, point well taken. We also, we also all master language as long as we're exposed to it before 12, and I think that's a very complicated skill, you know, to some yeah. degree. So that, that's, that's... So that's sort of... My point is, this is what our... A very, a very uh, charitable version of d defense of Erickson is what Erickson is simply saying is, look, the universe of things that are conquerable through sheer effort is probably larger than we think. That, you know, th and that I think is a very reasonable take, although Erickson is going way beyond that. Yeah, I mean, er Erickson is going way beyond that. He's saying that the appropriate genes for expertise exist in all people. I mean, he says that explicitly and, and essentially um, has, there's actually right now out just a uh, issue of the journal Intelligence where Erickson makes his claims and then there are responses and he's really on an island um, in yeah. that in the scientific community because he's backtracked so much that his hypotheses have become unfalsifiable. Where he says, well, if two people don't progress through practice at the same rate, well, it's because one of them you know, probably wasn't motivated enough at some point in the past, so you just can't even test it anymore. Mm -hmm. but, but I think that's a great point. I mean, I think there's a likelihood that people sort of underestimate the ability of transformation through, through training. Um, that said, I think it's very task dependent. So like Phil Ackerman, the guy who designed one of the um, complicated, Georgia Tech, one of the complicated air traffic controller tests, has found that on open, it, the more open a task is, like the more, the, the more unlimited the moves are, the, the greater the differences become with training. The more people diverge as they train. Mm -hmm. And the more closed the task is, the more they converge with training. And so I guess the question would be, is cardiac surgery an open or closed task? I would say that in the large part, 90%, 95% of the time it's closed. Could um, I don't know if I want the random human being operating on me in the remaining 5%. <laughs> that would be my concern. But uh, yeah, no, I will, um, but then you can sort of add to that, let me add to that another variable, which is um, uh, that our definition of motivation in this instance is a really interesting one. Um, and we assume that, Erickson maybe even assumes, that when we talk about that someone is capable of mastering something given sufficient practice and, and motivation, the motivation to practice, um, is the motivation to, to what extent is the motivation to practice something that is hardwired um, or something that is entirely uh, environmental? So I have a number of thoughts on this. I remember years ago I wrote a piece for the New Yorker, and I remember reading this book about Wayne, great book about Wayne Gretzky, in which it talked about how, as a th I think as a three-year-old, he would sit and watch Hockey Night in Canada and be absolutely transfixed, and when the game was over, he would burst into tears. And he would cry because it was a, the game was over. Even at that age, in other words, there was this, he had, there was something about the game of hockey that satisfied him and thrilled him on some deep emotional level. Before he could execute any of the physical moves associated with it, the game fit his imagination. And I, I wonder whether, first of all, I don't know what that is. I assume that's something that must be innate. Um, to, a, to a large extent, but it's something quite different from what we normally associate with <coughs> hockey skill. In other words, he has a, Wade Gretzky has a series of physical attributes that make him a great hockey player, but he also has this weird thing about how his, the game fits his imagination. Um, in, you know, so it's almost as if we're talking about Wayne Gretzky in the same way we would describe uh, a, a, a musical composer. I mean, it's almost like Classical music fits Chopin's imagination, I imagine, in the same way as a three or four year old. Um, so that's a kind of, I wonder whether we have an inadequate understanding of the notion of motivation that feeds into this um, argument in a. And, and how motivation might interact sort of with biology. Because yeah. that's an interesting point. I mean, one of, 
I'd say my, my favorite interview I did for my book was with a woman named Pam Reed, this legendary ultramarathon runner. So she was, I interviewed her the, she had, the day before she'd run the uh, Ironman National Championships in New York, qualified for Worlds at age 55. And I'm interviewing her the next day, her flight out of LaGuardia is delayed, and she gets so uncomfortable sitting still that she'd stashed her bags in a corner and was running laps around the parking structure while I'm interviewing her the day after Iron Man. Like, this is a woman who ran 490 laps around a drab one mile loop in Queens, you know, because she cannot sit still. And so yeah. she searches. She, like, wait, she ran 490 yeah. laps around yeah. the. Yeah. Wow. And, and she, so she clearly has this compulsive drive to move, right? So she actually keeps up with the rodent literature, like studies on breeding mice for high activity. So you can breed mice really easily. If you take a group of mice, you notice some run a little more and some run a little less, and you separate the high runners and the low runners, breed them in six generations, you'll have these guys over here will be like, they'll just like flop on the wheel and like, you know, like spreading batter. And these other guys will be like absolute crackheads for running <laughs> to the point, no, no, really, like they'll go through withdrawal and you give them like drug, if you prevent them from running. And you know, usually this is to test drugs like, like Ritalin drugs that cause people to stop moving when they have a high drive to be physically active. So I actually, I, I hadn't thought about that point, but I think that's really so, interesting. But this is interesting. So if you had to, let's think about this with respect to, uh, what was her name again? Her, Reed. Pam Reed. Pam Reed. Um, she clearly, we have a series of, uh, of um, genetic factors that contribute to her extraordinary success. One thing is what you're talking about, which is that she has a kind of, there is a fit between the act of running and her physiology and imagination and all those kinds of things. And the other would be much more conventional things, her VO2 max, her running economy, et cetera. Um, which of those factors do you think is more important? I think, uh, I think the longer the race goes, the more important her motivational factors are. Yeah. Um, and for training for a race like that where um, you're, the entire time you're running within your aerobic capacity, and the runners aren't really being separated by running economy that much. I think the motivational factors. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, so now this, this, the second thing I would say about if that is the case, um, I wonder whether uh, uh, motivational factors that begin as something hardwired are the ones that interact most robustly with environmental factors. In other words, um, suppose you, you, have, you put a group of people who, are, uh, uh, who have a mild genetic predisposition towards running quickly and you stick them in Jamaica, um, the interaction between that genetic predisposition and their environment is intense, right? I mean, on absolutely every level, you are reinforcing that tendency just by walking down the street um, in a way that I wouldn't imagine that there would be that same degree of interaction with, um, a, with your VO2 max or with the genes that would govern your running economy. No, I, I think there's a lot to that. And actually, again, thinking about cognitively complex skills, when you look at like prodigies in art, math, and music, right? Like they'll score differently on IQ tests. They all score really high on working memory, but then they'll have, they'll have these sort of associated abilities sometimes that end up determining like where they're actually going. So there's mm -hmm. some, even, even if they have, um, some high level of cognitive ability, then it turns out like other things determine where they actually decide to go in, in the field. So I think for yeah. sure there's some interaction between, those, between abilities of all kinds and, 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 and the, the in, in You mentioned that uh, study of mathematically precocious youth. My, if memory serves, I, I always thought the most interesting thing about that study was uh, you have in the beginning roughly equal numbers of very, very able boys and girls. You track them for whatever, 30 years and then a lot of the girls fall out and don't end up getting doctorates in math and science. And they're trying to figure out, in trying to figure out why, one of the hypotheses was that the, it was entirely a, a social construct around excellence. The boys defined what they liked as what they were good at. The girls did not define what they liked as what they were good at, right? They were socialized to think of what you liked as, you liked what you liked because you liked it, not because you were good at it. Um, and so they, Quite understandably, just because they were in the 99.9th percentile in mathematics, didn't feel they had an obligation to go into mathematics, which is an incredibly, first of all, benign explanation for uh, long-term differences in um, excellence, um, uh, but also a really uh, intriguing one, because it's, it, once again, it's this, this really fascinating interaction between a, um, a or it's, it's, a, it's the environmental nullification of 
of a genetic trait, which is a, a, a concept that I think is um, really cool, um, you know, that you can cancel out. I mean, I suppose there's tons of examples of that, but um, that is one of the ways in which we, 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 we cancel out excellence, in other words, because of these relatively um, uh, mundane uh, uh, organizing principles and our uh, environmental organizing principles. I, I agree with that completely. Um, and can I, can I make a total aside? You just asked you a question I've been wanting to ask. Sure. Sure I was hoping you'd say at the beginning. I, I actually would, because I, I want to give you a little bit of a hard time about it. Um, the, uh, I'd love to hear your description of the 10,000 hour rule because um, you called it the rule. And, and so I just want to know how you define it, because I've been thinking through it yeah. even this morning. Well, I didn't, you know, it's funny. When I wrote, when you write a book, you have no idea what parts of the book people will be drawn to. And in my experience with writing books, I have always been wrong in predicting what people would find interesting, massively wrong. So invariably, I will write a chapter and think, that is the that is a fantastic chapter, and I will never hear about it again. And then I'll write something else, like literally I'll spend a day in the library, toss off a couple of paragraphs, and then that's all they talk about. I had no clue that anyone would care about the 10,000 hour rule. I thought it was just this kind of, I like wrote it in a very short amount of time, and I was simply trying to get somewhere else, which was I was trying to make this point about social support that since the thesis of Outliers in part was that uh, success is a group project, one of the ways to explain that is to say, once you understand how much work is necessary for even the most talented people to get anywhere, um, then you, you grasp this point intuitively. So 10,000 10, hour rule is a way of making that plain. Look, you've got to do it for 10 years. If you're going to do something for 10 years, good Lord, you need a lot of social support, right? It cannot be done. And then you begin to understand how much socioeconomics plays into achievement. If you realize that you need 10,000 hours of chess playing to be a grandmaster, you understand why there are no poor grandmasters. Can't do it. If it was this, you could have grandmasters who grew up in the slums of Rio, right? You can't do it if you, so that was, all, that was the only reason I was doing that, because I had just met with, uh, uh, with the great programmer, um, Bill Joy, computer programmer, Bill Joy, and he was just describing all the things that had to happen for him to master programming. And it was just like, the list is this long of kind of, so anyway, that was my, I just thought that was it. I'd never hear about it again. And then. And then a rap song got written about so it. So then people like kind of, and so I was, I had to kind of think, oh, what did I mean by all that? So, so and I ask, and I, I give you a hard time about it because you called it a magic number and a rule and then criticized me for picking people who had only accumulated 11,000 hours. Well, are you saying that I'm, I'm inconsistent in my criticisms? Of course I am. I, 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 why would I be otherwise? Um, no, I called it a, I didn't, you know, I, there is a certain amount of journalistic um, license that one takes in describing principles. I always think it's fun to take an observation and call it a law or a rule just because it gets people's attention. <laughs> and then you're always saved by the single greatest uh, phrase in the English language, which is, the notion of the exception that proves the rule. I remember first hearing that at the age of like nine or 10. First of all, it took me three years of thinking about it because I was like, whoa, that is such a freaky idea that you could have a rule and then have an exception to it and say, but the exception proves the rule. And then I realized what it is is just a fabulous way by which um, people give themselves an out. It's, it's a bunch of people looking to cover their ass inserted a phrase into the English language that they can pull out at a moment's notice to justify all inconsistencies in their thinking. It's like, what's not to love? So, so I think one kind of important point you make that, that actually made when we were on the, the radio, which was like the one time we talked together before this, was that your idea was that these things might take more practice than people think. Right? And mm -hmm. I think that, that's interesting. And I, I don't know exactly how much people think, but I do think that that's a really interesting point. But if, if someone, you know, again, wanted to play devil's advocate, they could say, well, it, what are you saying? You know, because you're not strict the way Erickson is. So no. what are you saying other than after you've been screened for a certain level of ability, you'll be better at something when you practice more as opposed to when you've practiced less? That would be like the most watered down version. Yeah, right? I guess I would say, I would say, I would say exactly that, but with one little addition, which is, um, and absent practicing 
at some threshold level, you will not reach the full level of your ability. In other words, that I really do think there are, there are hard thresholds for the overwhelming majority of performers in cognitively complex fields. Um, and you, I don't, you can't, I mean, the classical music composition stuff is the most interesting. You know, that great study by John Gray where he looks at, uh, I forget, 75 of the greatest classical music compositions of all time and asks the question, at the time they are composed, how long had the composer been composing? And there, is, there are only three cases where the composer had been composing less than 10,000 hours at that point, and that was 8,000 and two at 9,000. So there we can say, look, if you want to do a great work of classical composing, you absolutely have to do many, many thousands of hours. It's not, it does not, it is simply not possible for human beings to produce excellence in that realm without putting in the time. And that is a really, really, you know, in a day and age where we celebrate, you know, turn on the television, you, we celebrate these kind of flash in the pan kind of success stories. It's a really important point to say that it, it just doesn't happen unless there's a huge amount of, of uh, also I think, by the way, one of the problems with this research in general is that lots of people who are very able systematically underestimate the amount of time they spend practicing. And this is, whenever, if I might, raise a minor quibble with um, some of your observations about variability. I think a lot of times when you see large amounts of variability in people's estimates of how many hours they spent practicing, it's because some people are lying. These are all self-report studies. Right. If you ask an English person how much time they spend practicing, they're gonna say, oh, I never practiced at all. It's a cultural thing, right? So like they're saying, I practiced only, I would do it on the weekends, like Roger Bannister. Yeah. Well, he was ditching gynecology lectures in med school, you would, 45 minutes of training a day. Yeah, you would think that he was doing, you know, wind sprints after work and yeah. ran a four-minute mile, which is just such nonsense. It, 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 <laughs> and, and so... By the way, Chris, did I send you that thing about... Was it Chris Chataway who just died? Yeah, he did. Who was the great training... He was one of the pacers who paced the first sub-four-minute mile. One ever. of the great English runners. To his dying day, was still, was still maintaining that he barely ever trained. So he ran like a... An insane, at the age of like 60, ran sort of 34, 34, I'm making this up, I can't remember. Really, really fast 10K. I was like, oh, barely ran at all. You know, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. It's like English upper class, like, you know, nonsense is what that is. So, and to, to your point about that, actually, I, I asked Erickson when I first realized there was no measure of variance in the, in the sort of what I'll call the famous 10,000 hour study of his. Um, you know, I asked him, actually I invited him to a panel and at the American College of Sports Medicine, a physiologist asked him, you know, what was the variance around that 10,000 hours? And he said, well, actually when we asked the performers to, because it was retrospective um, data, to estimate how much they had practiced, they weren't consistent on multiple accounts. So his first answer was that the data weren't good, which yeah. isn't that great of an answer. Yeah, and then encouraging. the physiologist said, well, many of us struggle with imperfect data in our field, but I never remember us leaving out measures of variance, so what is it? And he said, well, you know, I can't really remember. He says, is it 10? Is it 100? He said, it's definitely more than 500, and most of the people did not accumulate 10,000 hours. So I just think it's important to, you know, include those measures of variance, but also not every study is retrospective, asking people to look back. Like, there are longitudinal studies of some things. Mm -hmm. um, so, but anyway, to your composer point, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about Mozart, because you write about him, and, and, and I agree with you. There's, there's no sort of, no one, like, falls out of the sky able to compose, but but I'm not convinced that people thought that was the case. Maybe they did, or that they thought they would get there faster. But every music prodigy ever tested also is in the 99th percentile for working memory. So it's like a really high, mm -hmm. then plus that, a lot of work. But I know you, I mean, you've written about Mozart, and I'd be interested to hear you talk about Well, just that Mozart composes at a very young age, but nothing, it's terrible, um, until he's in his mid to sort of early 20s, at which point he's been composing for 10, 11, 12 years. So Mozart is, is a really interesting, when we talk about prodigies, in other words, what we're really talking about is, um, uh, is people whose trajectory is, whose path towards genius is um, slightly steeper, or who are simply showing promise in some sense or another. But the, we, we need to be clear that the product of the prodigy is not on a par with the product of 
of the mature in these kinds of, of, of cognitively complex domains is not on the um, is not on a par with the product of, of the mature e practitioner. E even in non-cognitively complex domains, right? Like Yao Ming might have been six feet tall at age 10, and you'd say, well, he's not as good yeah. as he's going to be eventually. Yeah. But it doesn't take away from the fact that he's very, very precocious at the same yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's, let's talk about um, thresholds for a moment, because this is another mild point of contention between you and me. Uh, I had in my book a discussion of this principle of the flat maximum in psychometrics, which is that um, at the top of any distribution, the, uh, the measures that you use to discriminate among individuals begin to lose value. So this is the, Arthur Jensen, the greatest, one of the great psychometricians of all time, makes this observation about IQ, that IQ is hugely predictive uh, around the uh, means, around the middle. Um, it really, really helps to know whether you have an IQ of 95 or 105. It does not help you at the, at the left and right end, uh, left and right edge of the curve, particularly the right edge. Um, knowing whether someone has an IQ of 140 or 175 is not useful in knowing whether they're going to be a great biologist. That's not the predictor anymore. The, the interesting predictor is how hard do they work? How creative are they? Um, particularly when you realize how much creativity diverges from um, intelligence at the high end of the, of the distribution. Um, and we know this from studies, from creativity studies, that it just doesn't, it stops mattering, which is why, of course, if I might continue on this, right? Which is why, of course, the entire theory behind admissions policies for elite schools in this country is bullshit. <laughs> you can't, Harvard pretends that it can meaningfully distinguish between people who score in the 95th and 96th percentile on their SATs. That is based on a complete misunderstanding of the usefulness of these tests. These are tests normed for people scoring at 1100, and you're kind of telling me, or I guess it's not 1100 anymore, but you're kind of telling me this is the only, this is the great uh, suggestion of, um, of uh, uh, what's his name at, at uh, I've forgotten the name of the psychologist, he'll shoot me, who says that the only intellectually honest way to do college admissions in this country is to have a cutoff, maybe the 90th percentile for elite schools, and then just have a lottery. Um, just names in a hat. And anything else is, is, a, uh, is, a, uh, um, is, a, is a, is a psycho, uh, is, a, is an obscenity. So, so I would argue, I think that if Jensen said that, I think in, in many ways it's been it's been falsified at this point. Because again, in that, in that top quartile, of, or that top percent of kids who were chosen at 13, so it, for creativity, the top quartile of that 1% was six times more likely to end up with a patent than the bottom quartile of the top 1%. And the, these, these are kids who, I think the top quartile, their mean SAT math at age 13 was like 690. So there's a ceiling problem with using the SAT to screen them. So I don't think it's a true flat maximum. They're just bumping up against the ceiling. So you can't mm -hmm. distinguish them. Because again, in, in the study of mathematically precocious youth and then the project talent, which actually just chose a random sample, it looks like it curves up the importance of abilities at the end. So I, it, it looks like maybe other factors um, are more distinguishing for the middle, but in the top, there are some people who just, you know, there's such a strict cutoff for what they're able to do. I mean, the, the I think chances of getting tenure in science and math eventually, th they were as good of predictors, those 13 year old test scores, as having gained admission to a world-class graduate school was later. So you could pick people at 13 based on those test scores or people who had like just gotten into MIT grad school and there wasn't much difference. In the yeah, but here's my problem with that. Um, that the, I don't like those studies because I feel like those studies are double counting. They are using as their, so the thing that makes you good at doing well on your SAT at 13 is the thing that makes it, you good at finishing your doctorate. But it tells us nothing about the quality of the work. So if you were to tell me that SAT scores at 13 predict your ability to check certain career boxes in your given field, I would say absolutely. I have no question about that. Because what are we measuring when we measure? The kid who gets 690 at the age of 13 on his math SAT is a kid who has already demonstrated a certain level of discipline and perseverance. And more than that, who has a, an abnormal and precocious interest in um, in, in, in uh, indices of performance that are valued by society. So what, that, does that kid go on 
try his best to get into Caltech and slog for seven years to get his doctorate? Of course he does. But that's not what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is, is the work any good, right? So I would love, and maybe I'm, I am doing the thing you're never supposed to do, which is asking the question that I don't know the answer to. Has someone done this study with a uh, number of citations on papers? I, I don't know, but I believe, and again, ju just, just, to, <laughs> just, just to make Spare sure, so again, we're, we're, we're talking about people in the top 1%, so none of these people are slackers, um, yeah. but I think that the... Oh, there are slackers in the top 1%. I th okay, I, I think that the... Uh, I mean, Tracy McGrady was a slacker in the top 1%. Oh, actually, we should talk about that, because he, he came... He came what? up... <laughs> that, that's... He, he surprising came, he to came up in a previous, there was a panel at Sloan previously that made me laugh because it was, there was an argument about the 10,000 hours rule by comparing Gerald Wallace to Jamario Moon. And I thought it was hilarious because there you're restricting your range to guys who are six foot eight who've played in the NBA and you're arguing about nature versus nurture. I'm like, you can't, yeah. you know, that's, yeah. um, but I think the top quartile was six times as likely to have had a peer reviewed paper published than the bottom quartile of the top 1%. That's as close as I know it. Yeah. Um, but, but Still so not answering my question. No, but, and, and you could be right about those things. The fact is, I think that right now, if you have a threshold hypothesis theory for those cognitively complex traits, the data, the two very long longitudinal studies um, would would resist it. And, and when we've talked about this a little, and I think as you restrict your range, so you talked about, you know, the uh, SAT is a lousy predictor for MIT students, right? And one reason, again, I think is because there's a ceiling for MIT students, so you're not actually getting the true measure. Um, but also, as you restrict the range of any sample, the, you know, you increase the error of the predictiveness of... of no, but no, no, I think you're, 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 you're misunderstanding something here, and that is the problem with the SAT is not simply that uh, the SAT is capped, right? In other words, so we can't be, it doesn't discriminate at the top end of, this, of the, of the uh, of the um, distribution. The problem is that the SAT is measuring only one of what, of a whole series of traits that are necessary for excellence at the top end. That's the issue, right? So that, uh, you know, when you see divergence between measures of creativity and intellectual, and, um, and cognitive, and, uh, 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 and other measures of, of, uh, of cognitive ability at the top end of the discrimination, that, at the top end of the distribution, that should give you pause, because it says your measure's not, your, the measure on which you are relying is not measuring the things you, you're interested in. That's Jensen's point. Jensen says, at IQ of 100, that broadly describes your ability to do all kinds of things we want people to do in the middle of the distribution. But at, a top end, if, you want, if, we, if we're looking for someone to do really, really groundbreaking work in biology or be president of the United States or start a startup uh, or any of those kinds of things, we're interested in such a wide range of, of traits. Why are we falling in love with one little um, narrow uh, test of ability? I, I don't think we should be in love with it. I, yeah. I agree with that. I, yeah. I, I wonder, should we talk about sports a little bit? Yeah, we should. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I don't know, really. Like, but, but I mean, it's similar issues, right? It's about yeah. like, because people in this room are interested in such an incredibly restricted range of performers where it becomes really hard to, you, you, you've both, at, the, at, at like the NBA level, you've started to, to both standardize the genes and the training that has gone into these people by the time yeah. they've gotten there. Um, so it presents well, a really interesting Well, this is a, we, a, a really, uh, the threshold argument bears out uh, uh, very nicely in the way you think about, for example, the NFL combine. So as opposed to saying, raising your eyebrows and saying, wow, he ran a 4.49 and not a 4.53, you might reasonably say that for 95% of the things we want NFL athletes to do, uh, any score in the, 40, uh, in the 40 below, I don't know, pick a number, 4.7 is not meaningful. I don't know, maybe it's 4.65, whatever, is not meaningful. In other words, we're really only interested in whether someone is a 5.1 or a 4.7. We don't really care about that extra uh, increment. That would, and then you could systematically apply that to a whole series of, of the kinds of things you measure in, a, in, the compound, in the combine and say, we have to establish these kinds of, of the don't care line, right? Beyond which um, further uh, uh, achievement is meaningless. And so maybe that's something really to do for sports, right? Is to establish those don't care lines. Um, yeah. That'd be, an, because I think big data is like flooding into sports before 
and, and, and in, in my view, being applied to amazingly little effect in most yeah. cases. Although, although I, I, I don't know in some cases, actually one of the ways I think I ended up here was I did some of my own data analysis oh, and uh, you know, went and asked Daryl Morey if I could ask him about him and said, I'm not going to be able to be a source for you on these things because um, it's all proprietary. But I think the combine is like a terrible measure for a number of reasons. One is which they're still using stopwatches and the error equals like the entire variance between players at a position. Yeah. And the, the bench press is important, right? So like bench, you have a huge advantage if you have short arms, which is exactly what you don't want on the field. So you might select against what you're actually looking for in the field. But the yeah. combine, so like I, as a slide I like to put up showing T-Rex. Terrible push-ups, great at bench press, you know? Um, but... <laughs> Uh, anyway, but I think that's a really interesting way to pose it. Where should we find the don't care lines? Yeah. I, I think that's, actually, I hadn't thought about it that way. I, I mean, that's, it, 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 they, that's the, the fix for the NFL combine is exactly the same for the fix for elite uh, colleges, is that they should be just clear thresholds. So should I just start at the top, like reading these? Uh, which ones do you like the most? Sure, whichever, one, whichever ones you think are interesting. Oh, okay. Um, well, I'll just start at the top here, and well, then I'll pass it to you. So for David, how do you think professional teams could use anthropological traits to select players as prospects? Do you think a time will come when teams will start genetically testing or even raising their players? So, um, <laughs> not so funny. You know, you know, several generations of Yao Ming's forebears were put together by the Chinese Basketball Federation in an effort to make Yao Ming. It worked. Um, that said, there are a lot of barriers to doing that. Um, um, <laughs> really? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Taste being just one of them, um, but but we do we know a ton about about body um, about body traits uh, that work in sports. And I mean, one of the very simple things I wrote about in the book was an analysis of wingspan and height uh, in the NBA. And actually, I came to Daryl because I, I was looking at wingspan to height ratios in the NBA. So average in the normal population is about one to one. The NBA is like 1.05. So the average NBA player would qualify for the diagnostic diagnostic criteria for Marfan syndrome, which is like the elongation of the limbs. And I happened to notice that the Rockets were drafting an inordinate number of the high wingspan to height ratio uh, players. Um, and started, I think Chuck Hayes was probably the, the smallest starting center in history, 6'5", but had arms that are like 6'11 or something. Sorry, Daryl, but that one's not secret. Everyone knows that. Um, but yeah, so in the early half of the 20th century, I think there was this, this idea, partly out of sort of bigoted science, that the so-called average body type was the best for all sports, medium height, medium weight. And since then, something's happened that that sports scientists call the big bang of body types, where uh, actually specialized body types have become more desired and the, and the search for talent has gone global. And, and body types have, you know, large athletes have gotten larger, small have gotten smaller. And so now we know all these things about what body types work in certain sports, um, as opposed to where they were all clustered around the average before, so you couldn't distinguish them. So there's, there's a lot that can be, can be applied, absolutely. Um, will teams start genetically testing? They shouldn't because you should, if you want to know something about someone's physiology, you should test their physiology directly, not their genes, right? It's like, why test for height genes when you can use a tape measure? Um, so there are a few exceptions to that, um, and whoever asks can come find me after and we can talk about that, but um, I don't think teams should start genetically testing for the most part, except for certain genes like that predispose people to, to worse effects from brain trauma and, and sudden death on the court and things like that. Yeah, we do have the great natural experiment we have going on right now in Las Vegas is uh, Andre Agassi and Steffi Graf's children, right? <laughs> who, we were just talking about that. Who, who wouldn't want to bet on that particular genetic experiment? Um, <laughs> do, uh, oh, a bunch of interesting questions. Um, Does the 10,000 hour rule explain the number of siblings in sports? Um, uh, and, and the question brings up the Mannings. Um, you know, there, I, in general, I, am, I don't like, as you know, extending the 10,000 hour principle to uh, sports because I don't think it's relevant. I think it was designed for chess and composing. And, but there are a couple of interesting exceptions. And one would be playing quarterback. Um, it would strike me that a lot of the chunking arguments about chess would apply very nicely to, particularly to contemporary quarterback play. Um, and the question is, do you have to have been exposed to a certain number of uh, chunks of, rep of sequences um, in, the, in the defense and your own offense before you can master that at the pro level? Um, and I would, I'd be really, really intrigued to for someone to study that closely, because it strikes me that would make sense. Um, in the same way that I think that golf might also be something that would fall under the 10,000 hour 
um, the, idea would, the idea of a threshold in golf would also be intriguing. But if you have siblings who are um, playing nonstop, as the Mannings do, absolutely, that would seem to fit that, um, that understanding. Um, uh, particularly if your siblings are as crazily competitive as, um, so you have the addition, and a father um, running around also throwing the ball at you. Um, so yeah, I think that, that it is sort of intriguing to think about um, as, the cognitive, as the cognitive complexity of certain sports increase, then the, uh, the value of certain kinds of atypical environments increases along with it, right? Would you say as, as the, and I, I think this is what you would say, which is why I'm asking, the, that the, as the complexity of the task grows, the baseline number of hours you have to put in to be competent basically yeah, grows. Absolutely. So this, the whole thing about you know, uh, kids coming out of Texas and the spread, um, having a, playing the spread and having an advantage in the pros is precisely what we're talking about, right? You have an environment where they're exposed, they're getting way more hours of training in that particular offense. Um, could you comment on the 10,000 hour rule and sports gene in random environments where we can't practice with sure outcomes? Um, I'm not sure I totally understand that, but I think there's an interesting point to be made there. So um, I guess one of the points I try to make uh, with respect to, to physiological traits uh, is that one of the, I guess, revolutions coming out of exercise genetics, just as um, something we've learned in medical genetics, that because my version of a gene involved in acetaminophen metabolism is different from Malcolm's, I might need three Tylenols while he needs one, or maybe no amount will work for me. There are genes being discovered that are similar to that for training, that, that mediate each person's gain with a certain training environment. So then the challenge becomes finding the optimal environment um, for each individual's uh, genome, and so, so I think that's part of the reason why uh, we can't identify sure outcomes from any particular training regime. Shouldn't that be what the NFL compound should be about? I thought that was, that susceptib your susceptibility to training, your sensitivity to training, would strike me as a, as a huge consideration in a sport like the NFL. And if you're gonna gather people together for non-football activities, that would strike me as a thing on the top of the list. I would like to know, how you respond to the kind of effort that I would like you to show over the next five years, right? No, I or think, in the NFL's case, the next year and a half. I, I think yeah, the the right. I think yeah, what genetic studies are pointing to is that it is it is trainability or rate of improvement or rate of learning that is what you would act, you actually want to try to measure. Yeah, if you can. yeah. And it also, it's it's what it's what we're getting at when we talk when people talk about um, upside, right? The tech, upside, which is often derided as a cliche. If you understand it as someone trying to understand the extent to which uh, the athlete in question is, um, is most sensitive to future training, then it's a really, really valid and interesting um, uh, uh, issue. Um, by the way, or do you think that it would be impossible to reach the level of being considered for the NFL draft if you were not someone who was highly susceptible to training? My, my guess is that it's, it's not necessarily impossible, that there could be people who have a really high baseline for certain physical traits where they could make it and, and you still wouldn't know about how. Yeah. Um, the, and, and, and the right kind of training, right? So there was just a study, four-year longitudinal study of Oklahoma State football players. They spent four years in the weight room, got, you know, working for speed and strength, got way stronger in the weight room, way more powerful, speed didn't increase at all. So either that means you have to get people who are fast in the first place, which yeah, at least that's partly true, or the things they're doing in the weight room are really disconnected from the outcomes they want on the field. And so uh, it, it, I think there's a high chance that you can get there without having actually done the kind of training that makes you better at certain things. Yeah, yeah. Uh... Can motivation or imagination for an activity be learned or improved <clears throat> or is it solely innate? Um, well, I would like to believe, you know, in the, the standard answer that a psychologist would give is that of all of the traits that underlie human behavior, motivation is the one most uh, environmentally determined. Um, so that would be, and that would explain why you have these really, the persistence of clusters of excellence in, um, in unusual places for, so I understand a cluster of excellence that has a genetic explanation, or at least a partial one like um, canyon running, but we have, it's more than that, right? We have Dominican shortstops and we have 
um, uh, Dutch football players, and we have all of these other things. So I would think that that would be, I think that the, the contribution that, um, uh, that social goals can make to, or society's value, social values can make to motivation are, are um, enormous. I mean, the, there was a, I saw this fantastic chart the other day, which was a measure of the extent to which various ethnicities are overrepresented in the medical profession. It's exactly this. And it's fascinating, there's, there's like, by the way, it's not what you expect, but the three top ones are overrepresented by a factor of five or six X. So just having, just being in a ethnic group that thinks being a doctor is really cool is massively important in determining who becomes a doctor. Um, I mean, and you're, you're in a training group now, right? And, I, and, you, and I've been in training groups. Anyone's in a training group know there's some people who naturally need to be managed to train more and some who manage to train less, need to be managed to train less. But I've always found a training group to be incredibly motivating right? yeah. as, as, yeah. as a construct or any kind of like peer group like that. Um, Do you expect to see a drop in talent levels with trend toward fragmentation of time from a very young age, i.e. kids in 30 extracurriculars? Um, I don't, um, partly because one, I think maybe they can do multiple things better now. So we, there, there are more chess grandmasters now than there used to be because of the availability of computer chess for study. So chess prodigies are, are you know, more of them are becoming grandmasters younger and younger. At the, at the same time, um, I actually don't think there's a trend toward fragmentation of time in sports. I think there's a trend toward hyper-specialization. Uh, and I think that happens to be, um, in many cases, it's sports specific, but in many cases, the opposite of what uh, the sports science is saying is the path to success. So there's the occasional Tiger Woods, um, who the first implement he picks up is the one that he succeeds in, and that's an amazing story, although I think there's no evidence that that can sort of be forced. Um, but I think the more typical pattern is the Roger Federer, whose parents, um, you know, were my, one of my colleagues described as pulley, not pushy, where he was doing a lot of different activities. And I think that's one of the reasons why the elites, elites practice less at an early age. If this is a practice graph, and it goes like this, and here are the eventual sub-elites, and it goes like this, and then the elites cross over. And there's some evidence, because of the way the data was gathered, you can't tell for sure, but there's some evidence that some of those people are going through what's called a sampling period, where they're trying a bunch of different things, finding what fits their mentality, what fits their physiology, before they focus in on it. Um, and so I think actually we should try to preserve some of that uh, early fragmentation. Um, that's what I write about in the afterword of my book, so everyone should buy it. Or the new that's coming out later. Following on that, I'm curious as well about whether um, you and I both ran competitively when we were younger. Uh, and my observation from age class running is that you, the, the, the success at age 13 is very, very, very loosely predictive of success at age 21, um, in large part because you have an incredible amount of burnout. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I wonder whether the concept of burnout is something that we have um, underestimated in this kind of, as that may be another factor in the dangers of hyperspecialization. So. Actually, if you look at the tennis data, there's, I think, two things that burnout that you're talking about and something else you've written about are huge factors. Because if you look at like girls who are good at tennis early on, they will almost invariably, the best girls will almost invariably have quit while they're still teenagers. And I think it's one, burnout, you know, and two, that they're just early physical developers. And so mm -hmm. somebody sees them and says, wow, we, you know, we've got something here. We need to push them to practice. And as soon as everybody else goes through puberty, they get caught and they're not used to losing and then they, they quit. So I think it's, it's a factor of two things that you've talked and or written about. Yeah, yeah. I always wondered, you know, the, it, it strikes me that this, the trend towards hyperspecialization has a, Surely it has a perverse end, and that is to say that what you really want when you're trying to develop an elite core of athletes in any given group, you want to start with the largest pool imaginable of potential people. But what happens now, and that's easy to do if the, if the, if the expectation about what kind of effort is necessary for reasonable success is relatively modest or achievable. What happens with hyperspecialization is you, you start to diminish the pool at the outset. You realize that, oh, if I'm gonna, if I wanna be a real tennis player, I gotta go to Florida to a tennis academy from the age of seven. And so you direct your child elsewhere, right? So it's, it's perverse. I mean, after a certain point, wouldn't you expect our, our high level achievement in certain athletic fields to start to get worse, not better, if this trend continues? I, I do, yeah, and, and because I think more normal than the, 
the kind of Tiger story is the Steve Nash who didn't own a basketball until he was 13, right, but was a very good soccer player. Yeah. Um, so I do, absolutely. I think yeah. our achievement will get worse if the trend continues. I mean, it would be interesting to, to think about how you would optimize a national strategy for sports performance, keeping that in mind. I mean, you, for example, would it, be, would it make sense then to ban certain kinds of um, national level uh, sporting activities for kids below a certain age? That's a great question. Ed, Ed, there was, um, I can't remember this girl's name, but a, a girl's like one of the top youth players in hockey and tennis in the country. I saw her speak and she said you should ban travel for girls her age, and she like is the top, you know? Um, and so that's yeah. That's my, my rule is that the travel to the sporting event should not, be, should not exceed the duration of the sporting event. So if, if you keep that rule in mind, that that's would- That's gonna be really bad for like the 100 meters though, you know? Yes, it would be, it would be, really, it would be really bad for the 100, yeah. for the 100 meters. But, but, um. but the, the, the point you bring up is actually one I just heard um, just in the UK and people are really struggling with it, right? Because you want to delay that selection. The earlier you push selection, the more likely you include the wrong people, right? And yeah. so, the, but their problem is the sports are competing against one another. Like soccer doesn't care if they draw, if they draw off someone who might be really good at basketball, right? They're willing to just buy everybody and if one person turns into Lionel Messi. So the sports are competing against each other and I think the model you have to develop is to keep those, those people who are, de who are not selected, who, who might be later matures or whatever they are, um, don't disadvantage them so much that they become like not viable for any sport later on. Yeah, yeah. The, um, you can fix this. The Canadian fix to this is simply to have only one sport that people care about. <laughs> uh, just one. <laughs> I think we're. <laughs> I think that's. Uh, I think that's it. Good. Well, thank yeah, you I think we're out of time. David. Thank you. <laughs> Great panel. That was awesome. Thanks. That was very good. I always think of every email or every talk with Malcolm. I think of something that I want to go read more. About.